Okay, um, so we'll just, I'll just get started here and go for some uh, announcements. Um, welcome to Cross Pollinations. Um, I'm Ashley Elizabeth Buss. I'm the Administrative Manager of the League of Canadian Poets. Um, so Cross Pollinations, the Canadian Association for Health Humanities Virtual Round Series is sponsored by the League of Canadian Poets, the Canadian Association for Health Humanities and the Health Arts Research. Um, just going to give the League's uh, land acknowledgement here. League of Canadian Poets would like to acknowledge that this organization is situated upon the traditional territories. The territories include the Wendat, Anish Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nations, and the Métis Nation, Nation. The treaty that was assigned for this particular set of lands is collectively referred to as the Toronto Purchase and applies to lands east of Brown's Line to Woodbine Avenue, north towards Newmarket. The League of Canadian Poets recognizes the enduring presence of Indigenous people on this land. The League also recognizes that art, poetry, and poetic practice related to the work of our organization takes place in traditional territories of many different nations. We encourage each ten attendee here today to learn more about the treaties and histories of Indigenous people tied to the lands where you live and work. And another brief announcement here. Um, oh, my fault. <laughs> my mouse is uh, taking dominion here. Okay. Um, so mitigating potential bias. Um, each presenter has been given instructions about the, a conflict of interest form prior to their proposed session date. Included in this package are instructions on how to mitigate bias in their presentations. Uh, example, if there is any reference to specific medications in their presentations to use generic names. Through this process, we endeavor to prevent any perceived or real conflicts of interest. However, if any conflicts of interest become apparent during the session, please alert the session host, me, <laughs> via the Zoom chat, and we will interview. Okay. All right, I have a bunch of things open on my computer. Um, I'm just going to stop sharing now. There. Okay, um, so I'm just going to introduce. Good, Good thank you. Oh. oh, there we go. <laughs> yes, maybe you could, um, everyone could mute their mics if they're not speaking just to avoid uh, interference. Um, so I'm really excited to be here today and to listen to these presentations, to read this, these poetic, hear these poetic works. Um, I'm just going to introduce uh, Dr. Ched Jablonski um, is an award-winning teaching family physician based in Calgary, Alberta. In addition to family medicine, Ted is an associate director of the Student Advising and Wellness Hub at the Cumming School of Medicine. He is also the medical director of Jablonski Health, doing consultant work in sexual and transgender medicine for Southern Alberta for two decades. Ted is a sought after speaker, trainer, media spokesperson, and educator with many conference, radio, television, and video credits. Dr. J is a multi-instrumentalist singer-songwriter with 10 indie CD releases, is a published author, graphic artist, and passionate emerging playwright. He is creator and host of the writing DOC Retreats Workshops, which started in 2019. Ted successfully ran, cycled, and spoke across Canada in 2010 to raise awareness of seasonal affective disorder, SAD, and the stigma of mental illness. Some amazing accomplishments. Um, so, well, welcome, Ted. I'm just going to spotlight you so we can all focus on you. <laughs> Excellent. And can I share my screen? Yes, you're a co-host, so you should just be able to go ahead and share. Okay. Let's see if that works. Uh, oops. Hang on, if I can. Are you seeing that? Are you seeing my screen now? Yes, we are. Yes, we are. Excellent. Thank you. So thank you, Ashley Elizabeth. Um, yeah, it's great to be here. Uh, it's good, good to see at least one friendly face, Tom. <laughs> so thank you for coming. Um, my mom isn't here, so you'll, you'll have to act as, uh, as her. Yay, yay, Tom. Way to go, Tom. 
Um, so I was asked to speak uh, a bit about health, uh, physician health, physician wellness. Um, uh, and I have given uh, many a talk in this, in this vein over the years. I don't consider myself an expert when it comes to physician burnout, or I've not sort of done any research per se, but I do have my own ideas about um, ways that we might be healthier or might be happier. Uh, and I would rather like today focus more on the positive and, you know, ways that we can do something right here, right now, as opposed to uh, delving deeply into like sort of the more uh, theoretic or, um, you know, there has been a lot of academic writing about uh, burnout and physician wellness. And I, um, I'm not going to go there tonight. Hopefully I can go more on the positive side of, you know, what, what can we do right here, right now? um in that realm um yeah you've heard about that already you've heard about that already so um if i just left it here um i'm 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 a lucky guy um i just uh, celebrated my 40th anniversary wedding anniversary this past summer uh, i have two kids two grandkids um and we we have a lot of fun as a family i do appreciate um not everyone gets that opportunity uh, and I think that has really helped me to be healthy as an individual. Uh, and I'm, I'm honored and I'm exceedingly grateful for that, that I've you know, been allowed this in my own life, appreciating that not everyone uh, uh, gets that. Uh, you know, but that's uh, me. And again, a lot of, uh, because of that, or the support or the, uh, the ability to have that foundation, I have been able as a physician to venture into the arts perhaps more than a lot of other physicians. Um, so it's interesting, you know, I've talked about this uh, a lot to different groups. Um, a, lo a lot of physicians before they get into medical school have uh, an artistic background, whether that be formal uh, music training or, uh, you know, per per performing in some, some manner, perhaps elite, uh, like uh, done elite uh, athletics. Uh, so something at a, a really high level, and then get into medical school and life gets extremely busy, things get twisted and turned, and all of a sudden that gets put behind as a, I really honored that. It was really wonderful to have that life, but now I don't have time for it. I let it go. So I let all that artistic background, all that creativity go behind me as I, I go into my day-to-day -day work. Uh, and I think part of that is why some physicians really are not as happy as they should be, or, you know, they're doing the best job in the world, but yet as individuals, um, I perhaps have not seen their own, uh, their own self-actualization because you're spending too much time, uh, you know, working, working too many hours and doing a very, very difficult job. Um, and, and by splaying off a little bit of time, perhaps, um, they could be healthier and happier. And again, I guess this is the whole story that I'm going to talk about as we move forward here. Um, you know, number one. So here's me coming to work one day. Uh, this was Halloween day at the clinic. And I came and, and I was like, the first person came in and they sort of were dressed like, you know, I thought, that's weird. Like, why, why are you dressed like a hobo? Oh, it's Halloween. Okay, I get it. Yeah, yeah. And then the next person came in, the next staff person, and they were dressed exactly the same. Uh, and then the third and the fourth and fifth, everyone came dressed. Apparently, this is, you know, I wear plaid apparently every day. I didn't think so, but apparently that, that's what they tell me. Uh, so they all dressed up and uh, we had a good time, you know. So even in, even in a, a serious medical clinic where we do serious work, we can still have a lot of fun uh, and have that com com camaraderie, uh, uh, stumble on that word. Um, and, and, you know, again, maybe that's how I, I start this off is that I, you know, I will try to keep this light hopefully a little bit playful, even though we're talking about dark things at times. Um, you know, we talked about, I already mentioned the word self-actualization. You know, what do we need to be happy? This is uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So we talk about needs. We need to, you know, breathe air. We need to drink water. We need to eat food, etc. You know, there's a certain amount of things we need to do just to be alive as a human in the animal kingdom. But if that's all we had, we would be no better than uh, any other animal in the an animal kingdom. And uh, so above that, security of body, the safety issue, resources, mortality, family, health, property, above that, you know, 
being part of something that involves love, whether that be sexual intimacy, family, friendship, etc., then self-esteem, confidence, achievement, I, I move up that ladder and then into the, the, the top echelon of that triangle. Um, and I hope all of us can achieve that we can spend a lot of our lives in that top place where we can be creative, when we can be spontaneous, when, when we can have, you know, lack of prejudice and all these beautiful things that we, I, you know, I, I, hopefully we all strive for this. Hopefully we all somewhere achieve that to some degree um in our life and can spend a lot of our time and we're not just scratching for you know just getting by to make enough money for put a roof over our heads and, and food on the table uh etc um so that's sort of where this starts like if if that's you know if that's the case and if that's a hierarchy and if i'm trying to be at the top of that pyramid then how what do i do to to try to stay there um or to try to try to actualize so i've got now um three three sorry 10 10 different sort of concepts that i would say uh that i think you can you know we can all you can we can i can uh, put in place right here right now so living in the moment uh we you know people talk about this in different ways um and I, you know a lot of terminology use a lot of people put it in whatever context they do i think living in the moment is just um not living in the past and not living in the future. So uh, people who struggle with depression uh, tend to live in the past. What if this didn't happen? What if, what if, what if people struggle with anxiety tend to project out into the future? What if this happened? What if that happened? Um, and, and to be honest, like all we have is right here, right now. Um, and that sounds so easy and so simple and it's so difficult all the time to, to live in the moment. Um, but if we do and see what, you know, what is, what is the goodness of what's happening right here, right now, you know, you've already heard, uh, you know, what I like to do in my own life is to, is to be an educator, to speak to, you know, so I am in my happiest place right now, just doing, doing this, um, webinar <laughs> like this, I, there can't be a better thing right here in this moment in time for me to be then right here, right now, you know, uh, allowing this time. Uh, uh, you know, in anticipation of hearing a wonderful poet, uh, Eli, uh, you know, where, how much better could life be than right at this moment in time, right? And if I can put my, my head in that place and truly live that, um, that's a beautiful thing. I think with patients for the physicians out there, um, it's a real challenge that when we leave one room, literally we have to you know, take a deep breath in, deep breath out and go into the next room and, and be there 100% for that next patient. Doesn't really matter with the last patient and how, you know, what's happening in our own life, anything. We have to have a clear head. We have to give that person um, our 100% attention and we have to be right in the moment. Hi. And different little tricks um, I found, like sometimes just literally hand on the doorknob, literally for one second before I enter a room and just pause. And literally, even if it is a quick breath out, you know, some people will ring a bell or something that sort of, you know, is a cleansing thing before I go in. I don't carry a bell around. I don't, you know, take it that seriously, but it is a concept in my head, right? Clear your head. Now it's time to be there in this moment in time. You know, the next concept, exercise, a uh, huge, huge believer in exercise. I think this is one of the most under under a utilized therapies that we have as humans to try to uh, be healthier, both physically and mentally. Um, this is a tough, uh, tough sell to somebody who's really struggling with, with depression um, to say that exercise could actually help your depression when I, I can't get out of bed because I'm so fatigued and I'm just so depressed. But yet within exercise, we can manipulate neurotransmitters in our head. We can we can do so much. It's so powerful, particularly for the more the mild to moderate uh, struggles with mood and anxiety. Such a powerful tool, underutilized. Um, I think when I speak about my own personal story, my own struggles with mental health, this is one of the, the key uh, pieces that I think um, really, really helped me personally is by being religious with, with exercise um, uh, again, some might call it fanatical, but that's okay. I, I don't, I don't really care uh, what other people think about this. This is uh, the, the ability to do this on a regular basis. Um, and it doesn't have to be heroic, but just doing it very regularly and very consistently 
uh, is extremely powerful. Uh, I like to run uh, and I'm lucky again, I appreciate that not everyone can run, um, you know, whether physically or, you know, if there's any uh, challenges from a, a physical point of view, that may be an possibility. I'm the, I'm the lucky one who is getting older and hasn't, you know, it's not a problem whatsoever for me, but I find it the most creative time. If I want to create something or try to connect pieces that I can't connect, uh, I mean, some people go, you know, try to go to sleep, get a nap and see if they can dream and connect the dots in their dreams or in their, or perhaps go into a meditative state. When I'm running, that's when my head is connecting things that are disconnected or trying. And I come up with all kinds of crazy ideas when I'm running that are exceedingly creative. So I use my running time as creative time and it's a beautiful thing. So I think of my running as more of a, a mental health exercise than a physical health. And I just you know, it's lucky that when you exercise, you get physically more healthy because I think it's a hundred percent a mental activity, pure and simple, which is, you know, and some people struggle with that concept, but so be it. <laughs> Do more. <laughs> it's a beautiful thing. Uh, less is great. So I think we're living in a consumer based culture. Um, and as physicians, again, I speak to the physicians out there. Um, we have the ability to, to have a very, very good living. We make good money. Uh, and if we work harder, we can even make more money. If we work even harder than that, we can even make more. Like, um, it's a very, um, it's a very um, tantalizing uh, to, to uh, at, at a time of having huge amount of debt as a student, to be able to practice in a career where you actually can financially do very, very well if you work hard. But this is a place where I think less is better. Uh, the exception being sleep. I think we all need more sleep. So <laughs> less is great for everything except sleep where we can all breathe more as a culture and probably as most individuals. Um, but I think we have to get our head out of this concept that I work very, very hard. So I'm owed something. You know, I deserve to have a bigger house. I deserve to have more cars. I deserve to have more materialistic things because I work hard for and I'm, I'm worthy of it, right? I've helped people. I'm in a you know helping profession, so you know I'm putting it all out there. So why shouldn't I get it all back in some way? Uh, and you know we all need to have a roof over our head, and eat, and etc. But I make a case that less less is better than more for the most part. And and if we could get there, we'd probably be a lot happier um, than than duking it out with commercialism and never finding we're happy no matter what. We get more, but we're still not happy. We want more, and so like that—that that is not the the uh, our source of, of uh, happiness. Uh, technology, protected time off. I think we need as a as a, we need to figure out how to manage this thing, <laughs> the cell phone, <laughs> my blurry cell phone. Right, um, it's killing us, uh, and uh, and we are you know perhaps our our kids, uh, they've been brought up and and wired to technology so perhaps it has less effect on them perhaps or perhaps it no, i'm totally wrong on that but i mean um generations who weren't so wired to this or weren't brought up um this this technology is killing us uh because we don't know how to manage it and it's managing us horribly uh and in the medical profession um you know we can be wired to our our email to our uh, cell phones and there's we're inundated non-stop and it's never, there's never time off. If we so choose to be there, you know, if everything's urgent, then everything's urgent, we have to manage it. Uh, so some, some way we need to figure this out. Uh, and I think we do need protected time off. Um, again, I reference my exercise. If I'm exercising, I refuse to answer the phone. I refuse to answer a cat. I refuse, it's just, no, you're not messing at that time. That's my time. I'm very efficient with, with my communication and problem solving but not when it's on my time. On my time, there's no way you can break that. So again, there's times when we have to do it and we do the business and there's other times we have to, nobody, we should have that protected time in some way, shape or form. Uh, limiting negative things. And this sometimes is mostly negative people around us. I think we have to choose to, to spend a lot more time with people who are positive and who can uplift us. And if somebody who's really negative, we have to really, Try to, well, if, if, if we can avoid them, avoid them. If, if not, then keep our conversations very brief uh, and to the point. 
when somebody who's extremely negative in my world sends me a long, long email, I'll answer it with one sentence and that's it. And that's all you get. I'm not, I'm not engaging in this, uh, whatever it be, you know, gossip or, or the negativity of everything's, everything's bad, 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 or whatever politics, etc. So you can do it. It's not easy. Um, and, and limiting news sometimes, I mean, limiting things that are really going to pull us down. Um, we have to be in to, obviously in touch with things around us, but it doesn't mean we have to be obsessed with them to the point that we can't uh, be happy because of all the happiness of people around us. Again, I allude to, you know, phys as physicians, as medical people, I think we have the best job in the world, the best career, and we can do a lot of good uh, if we so choose and we can be on the positive side or we can live in that negativity if we so choose. If we want to live there, we can, we can live there. It's our choice, but we don't have to. Uh, we do not have to. Um, and it's amazing. I, I find myself, uh, you know, there's some days where you see patients on a list and you know, oh God, that's it. That's, you know, that's the most challenging patient I have. And they're, they're really, really tough and they're really going to drag me down. And I just, I go, you know something, give them the chance today. What if they don't, what if they're not that person today? What if you go in the room a little bit lighter, you go give them a chance, joke around a little bit, and all of a sudden they're not that patient. And all of a sudden it's amazing again, with the attitude, as opposed to going in there this is going to be, you know, nasty, and this is going to be bad. Well, if I go in with that attitude, it probably will be. I probably you know, self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, Brown just learned to say no. No is a one-word sentence. Uh, how powerful it is when you really don't want to say, do something. It's really going to actually, again, pull you down, not make you happy. Uh, just saying no and then shutting your mouth. The hardest part is saying no is sometimes easy, but then it's always a but or a no. Okay, I'll, I'll only do that if you, if it's only this, like as opposed to no. And then the other person is like, oh, okay, I'll have to ask somebody else. I win, right? So sometimes we do have to learn how to say that. Very, very difficult. It's taken years for me to ever say no to anything, but uh, active time off, holidays. We need holidays. I love my holidays. Um, I got lots of holidays, you know, planned, uh, you know, I think patients, again, docs are always saying, you know, I can't, my patients, you know, they, they, they need me, they can't manage without me. And I'm going to say, yeah, they can, they can. In fact, they want you to take vacations. So, so you come back happier and in better, you know, able to manage them better. Because if we don't do this, we get more and more miserable and things don't work out. Uh, so I think most patients honor this. Uh, I think our colleagues honor this. We have to honor this in our colleagues. Our colleagues want to take a break and we can cover them or we need to take a break they cover us we need to do this more and more um if we're on a disability we need to take time off because of being ill we need to use that to time to make us healthy not just feeling guilty and and not really doing things that are healthy if you have time off then do things that make you feel good you know if being creative makes you feel good then be creative in your time off you know exercising or doing hobbies or whatever it is just go crazy because that's what it's for um, here's my creative, uh, creativity, uh, for me, as much as exercise has been a, a huge thing, uh, I, you know, I never profess to be good at anything I do creatively, right? You know, um, you know, I'm, you know, people, you know, I mean, you're a singer songwriter, you can play lots of instruments, but I don't say I'm good at it. <laughs> I don't say I'm a great songwriter, but that doesn't stop me from doing it because to be honest, it's all for me in the end, if I can be creative and that makes me feel good. Well, fantastic. If somebody else gets something out of it, hey, even better. But in the end, for me, because I don't make a living being, being a creative, um, you know, I'm a dabbler for the most part. Um, and I have done it, you know, semi-pro and professionally at times where, you know, there has been money on the table. But thankfully for me, you know, it's not how I make my living. Um, so I can, you know, enjoy it for what it's worth in its pure state. Uh, and I appreciate not every artist can do that. Some artists, it's, uh, you know, they have to make a living. So they have to be a lot smarter about how they are creative and what they do with that creativity. Um, you know, for me, I can just have fun with it for the most part. Um, and that's, you know, that's very freeing. Uh, and I say for to any physician, especially if it's, I don't have a creative bone in my body. Yeah, you, yes, you do. And you can, you can actually use whatever you have and, and just expand it up and enjoy it. I think, again, very underutilized our ability to go into this world and to let our mind wander, just be free of some of the shackles of, you know, med medical practice is very scientific, it's very regimented, 
there's rules. And if we can somehow break through that, and sometimes that creativity is just forget the rules or forget, you know, just think, just, just have fun with it, you know, and let your mind wander a little bit. And that's okay. Um, you know, self-compassion, uh, give yourself a break. You know, it's, it's tough to be everything to, for everyone. And, and, uh, you know, we are type A personalities who think we should be, we should be everything for everyone. And, uh, you know, we are held up to a high standard. We can't afford to make too many mistakes. Mistakes mean bad outcomes. And so, you know, we hold ourselves to a very high standard in our profession. Um, but sometimes we need to just give ourselves a break uh, as human beings uh, in whatever that might be. Um, you know, because people, uh, especially physicians with burnout, say they do not do this. They hold themselves to too high a standard. Do not ever talk about this to anybody else. Do never reach out or never have anybody try to help them. They just stand alone. And that aloneness in that is always a source of much trouble. Uh, gratitude, if you haven't heard gratitude to, you know, be, be behind everything I've said up to this point. Um, you know, I think if we're grateful and we find good things in everything we do, I think that's a much better place. So I'm, I'm so grateful. Uh, most every day, you know, that I live, whether I'm at work or not at work, or if I always come with that heart of gratefulness or always find that goodness or be thankful, um, that just is very, very, uh, you know, puts us in a very, very up, uplifting uh, place. And I'll just end right there. I think I'm pretty well at 30 minutes. Um, and I, I uh, sure, am I still... Stop share. Let's stop sharing my screen. There we go. And can I end with, uh, again, we're going to have a professional poet read in a bit, but I'll, you know, I try my hand at it. And this is, this is my attempt to tell all, you know, all the uh, non-professional writers out there, we can all do this if we so choose. Um, you know, it doesn't mean we have to be great. It doesn't mean we have to, we just need to express ourselves and get it out there. And sometimes that's, um, that's really important. Uh, it's a poem I wrote, and it was basically was about, I guess, in some ways about, uh, you know, why physician burnout, why it's such a difficult job that we do. Um, so, uh, Pussy Willows. Gray. Snow again. Almost April in Calgary. Of course. Last appointment of the day. She erupted, spewed forth all the anger, guilt, shame, and tears pent up over a lifetime. Abusive childhood, failed marriage, unsupportive job, no friends, a pervasive, lonely existence she had secretly tried to end in the past. She threatened to end it now. Now, today was the day. I was a whitewashed wall splattered with her blood as she verbally pulled the trigger and blew her head off. Tears dried, meds bolstered, supports reinforced, packs made to rebuild her broken life. Still shell-shocked, an evening run might clear. The sun finally broke free, lighting up a small stand of spring's first pussy willows, exploding on leafless branches. Tears came. My pace picked up, legs lighter. I'd survived another winter. I'd love to hear from you, Eli. <laughs> Thank you, Ted. Um, but I think it's so important to remember that, you know, our medical providers are people too, and their health matters for our health. So um, I'm grateful um, for your presentation and everything you've said. Um, so I'm just going to uh, introduce Eli, a little bio here. Um, Eli Trek L. Ashawani Lynch is a writer living in Teotec. Their work has appeared in the Best Canadian Poetry 2018 Anthology, The New Quarterly, Arc Poetry Magazine, and elsewhere. They were longlisted for the CBC Poetry Prize in 2019, their book Not Body 2020, published by Metatron Press, was shortlisted for the KWF Concordia First Book Award. And their second book, The Good Arabs, was published by Metonymy Press in September 2020. They are the nonfiction editor at The Puritan. They are also an acquisitions editor at Metonymy Press. 
They are currently translating Gabrielle Lane Treble's Le Fille del Maine from the French forthcoming in 2023. With co editor Samia Marshi, they are editing El Gorobra, an anthology of weird and experimental queer and trans writing by Arab and Arab, sorry, Arabophone writers. Um, I also just want to say, as um, a, a disabled uh, poet who also lives with fibromyalgia, I am a big fan of Not Body. It's uh, one of my favorite books, and I, I really appreciate you writing it. So I'm very excited to hear you read today. Oh, thank you for saying that. Um, and thanks, Ted, for your presentation and also for sharing your poem. Um, it's really nice. I don't know. I've, I've more and more, I like really appreciate um writing that comes from non-writers um because kind of as you said you know when when you're kind of in whatever field or milieu you are, you're in like you're doing it for a specific reason and it's kind of nice to go out of that and see people who are doing it just for the pleasure of it and like what it means to do something creative just for the pleasure of it so um that's like something i've been thinking about a lot um so this is my book. It's called Not Body. Um, it is a book that is a combination of poetry and um, these fictionalized letters um, and a um, poetic essay um, that deals with my experience of uh, being trans and having fibromyalgia and kind of... Um, fictionalizes a bit of that and um a lot of these letters are written um to friends lovers and in-betweens and they often take place in bed um so I decided I'm going to read um one of the letters a short poem and then some of the some or all of the creative essay depending on how long it takes me um so I'll start with the letter dear friends lovers and in-betweens Standing in front of a pool of hot water, my body is ready for a disassociation that never comes. What a pleasant surprise. I remember the time my hands overheated so much in the low dish sink at work, all wet and wrinkly, my body feeling elsewhere, the heat rising in me, my feet no longer connected to my body. You tell me we must first jump into the hot, then the cold, but we mustn't scream. We wince going into the cold pool while this older lady toughs it out, starts doing the breaststroke. We breathe deeply to remind ourselves our bodies are not being attacked, but I still jump out of the pool before you, not wanting the cold water to touch my junk. Bessel van der Kolk is in the hands of every queer on the queerest bus in Montreal. The, the 80 houses them all, reading about trauma and boasting their somatic knowledge. I ask Bessel what it means that I don't fight or flight, and he tells me, freeze is most effective for you. I laugh because it's the winter in Montreal, so we are all frozen, but Bessel doesn't get the joke. He is hard to make laugh, so I try harder, telling him that I forgot a memory, but it came back so suddenly that it smacked me right back into bed. My knees start hurting when I walk upstairs. My back hurts when I lean in too much. Bessel asks me why I think pain is funny, and I don't have an answer. Would my life be less fun if I didn't laugh when my wrists start feeling like those of a person with osteoarthritis? I haven't lived long enough for my bones to wear down over time. Bessel has no humor, but I decide not to ditch him. I tell Bessel, I'm only 25. You got to think it's funny that I feel 80. Bessel thinks it's sad, and this is when I ditch him. Coke in Dutch means pond, depth, abyss, chasm, and vortex. I think Bessel might be too deep for me. XOXO, Eli. Um, so this one is called The Fatigue. The fatigue is just fatigue. It sprays my body like a numbing agent. Say the way I sleep might not be working. Say the way I eat might not be working. Hope to God the meds start working. The other day she said, you need firmer boundaries. Oh yeah, this goes back to Ted's talk. <laughs> uh, 
um, you need firmer boundaries. Sometimes this looks like an earlier bedtime. Fuel your body with hope that something might change. Like a bowl of rice steaming, put it in your mouth and huff too quickly, too impatient. But if nothing changes, keep moving. A challenge is only a challenge once you stop trying. No, I mean, a challenge is always a challenge when your body doesn't work right. What is right? They only say the right side of history when a few decades have passed. Someday we will look back and see much of the same. Say thank you for your friends and the family that stay in touch. What is challenging? Everything is changing. The fatigue is just fatigue until it's not. All right, and so um, this creative essay um, is towards the end of the book and it's called Self-Prescribed Bed Rest. And it kind of investigates fibromyalgia, um, which is often um, called a woman's disorder and kind of thinks about who that leaves out when we call it that. Self-Prescribed Bed Rest. If fibro is a woman's disorder and someone who is not a woman has fibro, is fibro still a woman's disorder? Or am I just a woman in disguise? Spoiler alert, that's just transphobia. I tried starting this essay wanting to talk about the difference between diagnosis for cis people versus trans people, but then thought, what about black people's experiences with misdiagnosis? What about indigenous people's experiences? What about Arabs or South Asians or East Asians or Latine or anyone else that far falls under the large POC umbrella? I recently read about Malone Mukwende, a second year medical student at St. George's University in London, who created a clinical handbook which shows how medical conditions present differently on black and brown skin. For anyone who is light skin, this has never seemed like an issue. But for anyone with skin much darker than the white skin presented in medical books, this could be a matter of life and death. The medical system is failing so many of us and diagnosis fails when those doing the diagnosing only know the assumed normal, cis, white, thin, able-bodied, neurotypical, and male. When specifically talking about trans people and fibromyalgia, the presumption that fibromyalgia is a woman's disorder banks on the fact that women have lower levels of testosterone than men. This assumption doesn't even encompass the experience of all cis women, let alone anyone else. If we've only just started understanding the way testosterone and estrogen function in different bodies, how am I supposed to believe that there's even enough knowledge to imply that higher levels of testosterone serve as pain suppressants? When I ask myself why trans people are never mentioned when we talk about chronic pain, the answer seems obvious, kind of laziness, an unwillingness to move out of their comfort zone, a frequent disregard of what my, uh, what, Sorry, a, a frequent disregard of what life might look like for someone else, what the reality of the world might be if we exploded gender to include more people, to look at the experiences of marginalized people, to under, understand that diagnosis is bullshit when it frames the conversation around two cisgender genders, around white people's bodies, around an able body or a thin one. Doctors use biology that they don't always understand to create frameworks and rules for diagnoses that leave many people undiagnosed, regarded as crazy, making it up, not easily categorized, and therefore unimportant or a burden. I don't necessarily see diagnosis as the ultimate end goal, but rather as harm reduction. How can I rag on diagnosis when it allowed me to start taking pills used to treat fibro? when my sleep improved so much overnight that my depression lifted more than it had in years. Diagnosis is important, important because it enables so many of us to find ways to cope and live through the capitalist world. The thing about including and thinking about trans people, BIPOC, disabled people, fat people, neuroatypical people, and anyone else deemed non-normative when it comes to all aspects of life, especially in the medical system, is that it helps us stay alive. And we are not just looking to be seen on TV, we are looking for our meds to be available and covered, and we are looking to be believed, and we are looking for trans women of color, for Black trans women to be uplifted to the front, 
We want safety and love, and we want access to meds, to mental health support, access to transition in whatever form it takes. It is time for so many folks to stop dying in such large numbers. And in my family, they used to tell us the story of the Lady of Lebanon up on Hadisa, prayed to by both Muslims and Christians, their conviction melding into one story. And Hadisa, she watches us from her shrine on the way up to the mountains. They, they say she cried one day, tears leaking down her face, a miracle. And they say she looked upon the limbs of a child in a wheelchair and healed them. He could walk, he could run, the happiest boy, the tears of Harissa, the top of the mountain, the telefrik we never rode for fear of falling down. And I've always wondered how she cured them, those sick kids, those kids in wheelchairs, when her perch was so inaccessible, circling up and around the statue, stairs I used to run up as a kid, making me huff and puff. And the roads in Lebanon, have sidewalks that turn into streets, and the roads in Lebanon have two lanes that turn into one. The cars still have to meet. You always have to honk if you can't see who's coming. The Lebanese driver is slowing their usual speed in the dust of the rocky road. But what about me or those of us with invisible disabilities? Where is our cure? How would anyone know we got cured if they can't see our pain? When people are constantly looking to God for answers, an entity no one can see, why can we not look to our bodies for, sights of pain, for signs of pain and believe in a disorder we cannot see inside a microscope or on test results? Has seeing always been believing? My little sister used to tell me about this green man made out of boogers who would come to her school when we lived in Lebanon. The building was an apartment complex converted into a school the second story parking lot converted into a playground where we'd have gym class. She'd tell me stories in which she arrived at school to find the playground converted into an amusement park. Rides everywhere, Ferris wheel and a small roller coaster, mirroring Dream Park, the theme park we'd go to in Zouk Mosbah. The booger man would come and chase everyone around the rides, ruining everyone's fun. My mind was her canvas and she was an excellent painter crafting images so visceral I didn't realize they were her dreams. The more she told me about her adventures with the booger man, the more I believed. Those memories of the booger man faded and only came back to me years later. Four years older than her, how had I believed her so easily? Was the image just so clear that I couldn't help but pull it into our reality? Can we say it wasn't real if it was real for the two of us? Fibromyalgia often feels like a fabrication. We try to paint pictures of our pain. We excavate metaphors and obscure concepts to describe what we experience. The pinpricks, the stabbing jolts, or we gesticulate with our hands, mirroring the movements of jellyfish through the water, a pain going in and out. Talking to friends with fibro, they all explain how they've how well they've studied the script, how often they've looked online to find out the common symptoms of fibro, even if they don't have them, to try and emulate the perfect patient. When I walked into my doctor's office, I racked my brain for the WebMD list I read the previous week. And with the dutifulness of a good memory and Virgo precision, I told him exactly how each symptom developed in me. If I sit in a car for too long without moving my legs, I lose feeling in them. They become stiff and painful. My hands and feet feel as though they are riddled with arthritis. He nods his head with every new symptom, ticking off a checklist in his own head. Sometimes the science of medicine is often memorization. Let's see. Um, skipping a little bit. Cure only allows us to see the world as one-dimensional. If doctors are looking for a one-track pill to make us all feel better, of course they will try to lump us all into one person, one biology, one being that can spend money for the chance at no pain. And when I say doctors, I mean the medical system and um, medical capitalism. Um, people say fibromyalgia is understudied because it is a woman's disorder. 
and this world of patriarchy doesn't care about women, but what if it's more complex? What if the complexity of fibromyalgia, its roots in trauma and biology, its reliance on multiple approaches to, be to be better understood is another factor for its lack of study? When the science of medicine is so obsessed with singular tracks, with singular cures, why would any scientist care about a disorder that falls so far outside what and how they are trained to understand? When I research trans people and fibromyalgia or trans people and chronic pain, no matter how many times I look, the answers are few and far between. The Google search coming up empty. I wrote this book a few years ago and it's been nice to see some kind of new stuff coming out um, even within the last three years. Um, but anyways, I check each day hoping for different answers, new studies, hoping today is the day new research comes to corroborate my own theories, but it never does. And we are reduced to our hormones, the gender assigned at birth, the female or the male of it all. And I'm not talking about forgetting biology, but the cis-centric story of it all is that women have pain and men don't. The cis-centric of it all is that women are weak and men are not. The cis-centric of it all is old stories we tell ourselves over and over, first through religion and then through science, the new immovable frontier. Am I a reliable source if the ache of my body tells me a story truer than any I've read? And we are animals, yes, and we are mimetic, and we are hiding in plain sight. The Eastern whippoorwill, or engouvlement bois pourri, French for rotten wood, disregarded junk in the pile of dirt on the ground, disguised as lesser than the little whippoorwill finding safety in its invisibility. So often, chronic pain is understood as primarily experienced by women. When the research mentions women, we can read between the lines um, to know enough that they are talking about cis women or AFAB people. While this can be applied to most diseases and disorders that are known to affect women primarily, I'll limit myself to touching the subject of pain, the thing that occupies my own daily life as someone who is not a woman. There are many theories about fibromyalgia, often interconnected, often defined as a neurological disorder. This is where the idea that fibro is all in your head might have come from. Many consider chronic pain, particularly fibromyalgia, a consequence of repeated trauma. When you've experienced repeated trauma, something like being physically or verbally abused over a long period of time, the part of your brain doctors colloquially call the logical part shuts down and your reptilian brain or instinctual brain starts firing off, increasing the dopamine produced by your body. When the trauma continues over a long period of time, your body's instincts and survival tactics change, often from fight or flight to freeze. In these moments, when your dad is yelling at you from the top of the stairs, your body tenses up, gets ready for the thing you are expecting. While you may look calm, your body is firing off signals, telling itself to do the things you'll need to survive. Since you are frozen, none of the energy your body has created is used through activities like running away or fighting. It just sits inside of you, a balloon filled with too much air, ready to explode. But you don't explode. You're tied up before you inhale too much air, and that air hums in your body, not released through your ears, not through your nose. When your body becomes so used to protecting itself in this way, it becomes hypervigilant. When it becomes hypervigilant, hyper anything deemed a threat sends it into a state of protection. Sometimes this might take the form of a loud car alarm shaking you to your core, your heart speeding up, your muscles tensing up. Often when that tension is released, one might feel extreme moments of pain. I'm just going to read a couple more papers here. Um, our understanding of fibro might also be explained by looking into the theory surrounding the fascia, a sheet of connective tissue beneath your skin, that separates your muscles from your other internal organs, that keeps everything held tightly, holding so many parts at once. Some people think that the fascia of people with fibromyalgia is inflamed, and with that inflammation, the feeling of full body pain. 
The other theory is that a body experiencing fibromyalgia will send pain signals to different parts of your body that are not actually in pain, as there are imbalances in your neurotransmitters regulation. The chemicals which send signals from the brain to the rest of the body appear to be disrupted in fibromyalgia sufferers. Sometimes you're just in bed watching high maintenance when your body tenses up or your leg feels like it's filled with cement or the pinpricks return to your arms and won't leave. The guy character was just biking down the street, his one-eyed dog in his backpack. There doesn't seem to be an explanation for this. My own theory is why not a bit of all of it? Either way, it becomes hard for me to understand why this might be something that only affects women. One doctor says, there's a notion among physicians that fibromyalgia is only a female, a female problem, so it's not a diagnosis that's often considered in male patients, and male sufferers are often overlooked. Many experts believe that there are probably many more incidences of men with fibro than the numbers indicate. Additionally, men tend to see doctors less often than women, especially for generalized pain complaints. Many men believe that going to a doctor for vague hurt all over pain is being a little bit of a wimp, notes another doctor. Consequently, the number of men who have fibro is low, but if no one actually talks about their pain, how are we supposed to know it exists? Is staying invisible or ignoring the problem another type of cure? What if we actually looked at men's pain or that of those forced to enact masculinity from a young age? or those choosing to enact masculinity as a protection instead of hiding it? What if we noticed the ways disassociating from so many parts of themselves does not manifest as a chronic pain, signals firing off into the body, but instead as a hidden pain, trauma that might articulate itself as violence, as repression, as anger, as bullying, as sadness so deep it's not allowed to be shown, as an anger we must not excuse. Would returning to our bodies, no matter our genders, allow us a deeper understanding of what's going on? Will we see the effects of centuries of white supremacy, colonialism, genocide, shame, fat phobia, classism, and other societal barriers and violences on our bodies? C.A. Conrad says, few things tire me more than imagining reincarnation, a child struggling all over again to not favor war, to not surrender to greed. Few things tire me more than trying to ignore all this pain. All right, and just to finish it off this little page. Is diagnosis, if diagnosis is necessary, sorry. <laughs> is diagnosis necessary when we already have words for our pain, when we can tell what we need because our ankles feel inflamed, our heads hurt, our stomachs are turning into knots? Is cure necessary if we know how to soothe ourselves through our pain? Liya Lakshmi Pyepsna Samara Sinha half-jokingly refers to people as those who are disabled and those who are yet to discover they are, dis they are disabled. Is disassociation the cause of this yet to discover? Are more of us in pain or ill than we think? And the birds of imitation pretending to be the thing that they are not a luminary song assembled from all the notes they hear, the lyre bird with all of its beautiful foliage, taking its name from the male's tail, the female left high and dry, though her own ability shine just as bright, taking on the song of other birds, singing for half of daylight hours, never wholly themselves, but never wholly someone else, letting the voices of others move through them, channeling their powers for survival, but shy only detected through the beauty of their uniquely blended song as they hide. In Brilliant Imperfection, Grappling with Cure, Eli Clare quotes Susan Wendell, who says, some unhealthy disabled people experience physical or physio psychological burdens that no amount of social justice can eliminate. Therefore, some very much want to have their bodies cured, not as a substitute for curing ableism, but in addition to it. And we are not the cure or the shapes we take to survive. We move in packs, visually diverse yet connected at our cores, pieces of truth emerging in group, through laughter, through our own songs intermeshed, through our battle cries, creating the loveliest blend of sound. Thanks for listening.
Wow, thank you so much. Oh, I'm so glad I finally got to hear you read from that. <laughs> um, I read it a couple of years ago and I've read it multiple times since. Um, wow, both both of your uh, presentations are so much going through my head right now. Um, maybe other people do as well. Um, like to open it up for questions or maybe, I don't know, Eli and Ted, if you, either of you want to respond